Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching The Big Picture with me, Frank Pereira. Well, in the democracy which I have envisaged, a democracy established by non-violence, there will be equal freedom for all. Everybody will be his own master. It is to join a struggle for such democracy that I invite you today. This was the Mahatma's vision when he launched the Quit India movement in August 1942. India's fight against British rule is often seen as a long-drawn battle developing in intensity since the early 20th century, especially under the tutelage of Mahatma Gandhi. At various phases, the movement saw itself gaining higher momentum. For instance, the non-cooperation and civil disobedience movement of 1920 to 22 and 30 to 32. However, the one call that pushed India towards its ultimate freedom call was the rebel cry of the Congress between early August 1942 and September 1944. The Quit India Resolution taken by Gandhi at the Gowalia Tank Maidan in Bombay was by far the strongest and most vociferous appeal made by the Congress asking the British to leave India once and for all. While on one hand the slogan Quit India was a message loud and clear, on the other, Gandhi's call of do or die infused the masses with a life of its own. On this edition of The Big Picture, we'll look back at the Quit India movement 75 years on. Joining me on the program today are Sucheta Mahajan, Professor, Center for Historical Studies, JNU, Professor Rajveer Sharma, RSS thinker, and John Dayal, writer and social activist. We'll also be joined on the phone line by Rajiv Vora, President, Swaraj Peet Trust. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. John Dayal, I'd like to begin with you. A watershed moment in, uh, in Indian history was the Quit India movement in 1942. 75 years on, where do we stand now? It was indeed a watershed and I have it straight from the lips of another icon of the movement, Aruna Asif Ali. She was my mentor for 20, 25 years. I worked with her, so for me, the history of the Quit India movement is, is not from books, it's from people who participated. It enthused the people is an understatement. The moment in history of 1942, August, was the middle of the Second World War. The Axis, the Allies, the division was also reflected within India. The people saw this very dramatic person, Subhash Chandra Bose. They also had the Mahatma. So his call, and, and the, I read through his speech again last night and this morning and while preparing for this thing, the, the text of his speech, if you read it, is, is like a Sermon on the Mount. Or well, you, you read portions of that. But if you go down, it talks of no hatred. It talks of a very unorthodox India that he envisaged. And he used two very prophetic words, which I, I was really stunned in the phrases. He said, you know, you could well have a Parsi ruling you, and you would say it's a microscopic community. And in many ways, Rajiv Gandhi was half Parsi. His father was a Parsi. And he said, there will be rulers who may not have participated at all in the freedom struggle. And there's a charge often laid at the feet of the BJP and the government of the day that they never participated in the freedom struggle, they were against it, and yet they ruled. And, and in many ways, the Mahatma laid down the moral rule that we shall die fighting for equality, we shall die fighting for an India where everybody is equal, and, and, and to read into it something more, something philosophical, something existential for coexistence, because Peace itself then was a weapon. And at the, at, at the peak of the violent crisis, to say that non-violence shall be a weapon, I think it holds true today more than it did in 1942. Mm -hmm. That is my reading of it. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Professor Mahajan, you know, 75 years on the Mahatma's vision, do you believe it's still intact? Are we working towards that vision? What's happening today? I wish I could say that we are working towards that vision. It doesn't seem to be so. We are in an atmosphere where intolerance and a politics of hatred, a climate of intolerance seems to be further pervading the country every minute. Uh, I wish I could be more hopeful. However, I have no doubt in my mind that the answer to the problems that we have uh, today 
very much lie in that vision of inclusive democracy that we evoked at the beginning of the program and uh, which as John Deal reminded us just now where one of the most uh, moving and essential parts of Gandhiji's call for quit India was uh, an appeal for uh, an inclusive movement where he said that no Musliman will be harmed. He said we are not going to have a Hindu party, we are not going to have a Hindu society that we are envisaging. This is going to be a country where the democracy that we are going to install once the British leave is going to be there for every community. The Muslims, the Sikhs, the Buddhists, the Parsis, he spelled out each one of them. The second point that I wish to make is that there is, there was a certain, I can only call it a Catholicity uh, in Gandhi's, you know, wider understanding, which I think we could do well to emulate uh, today. I mean, he, you know, uh, he was talking about nonviolence, but the Quit India movement was all about enabling India's greater participation in the war for peace, in the war for liberation from fascism and Nazism. And behind it was a desire and a determination to be part of uh, that the world would be made up of a whole list of nations. Uh, he was calling for the independence of countries from colonial rule. He talked about, he invoked uh, the freedom of the Dutch in Indonesia, he talked about Burma, he talked about the rest of Asia and he had a vision for Asian solidarity which I think given the current uh, face off with China and the problems that we're having you know with that part of the world I think could be something we could very much remind ourselves about. How to have a vision of non-violence and peace in a world where war and intolerance domestically sure. seems to be the sure. you, you, you brought up You brought up China, but I think China is a different ball game altogether. We'll leave China out sure. of it for the time <laughs> being. But Professor, Professor Sharma, you know, the national sentiment, the idea of nationalism, patriotism, has it changed over the last 75 years? Is it different today? Well, Mr. Pereira, two things I would like to uh, place before uh, you. One, that... Uh, Quit India movement was also guided by nationalists, uh, you know, the determination. Without nationalism or without nationalist commitment, perhaps the Quit India movement might not have even taken this shape. And uh, uh, the very statement of Gandhi, do or die, karo ya maro, basically was, uh, was, was uh, rooted in uh, the feeling of nationalism. What were we fighting for? We were fighting for our own nation. We were fighting for our own freedom. We were fighting for or against, you can say, against discrimination or, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the imposition of one's will. So, therefore, there is no, uh, there cannot be a, a different kind of a definition of nationalism. Nationalism is basically a love for one's own country. Nationalism basically is a feeling of sacrificing for one's own country, if need be. And nationalism means to keep self behind the activity. So this is what uh, nationalism, in my view, is. And uh, so far as Gandhi's vision is concerned, even again I would say that there's no need for, uh, for being so uh, desperate about uh, the vision not being fulfilled. The constitution that came out, otherwise you can, you can take it even politically also. Gandhi wanted that the Congress has, has met its purpose now and it should stop to be a political party. But I don't want to go into that kind of a, mm. an area. I would say that the kind of inclusion which he was talking about, the constitution is a document which is inclusive in nature. It is not exclusive. Whether it is the questions of uh, gender justice, <coughs> whether it is the questions of social justice, whether it is the questions of equity, equality, justice, from fundamental rights to preamble to directive from state policy, everywhere you will find that constitution talks of inclusion, right? But 
sometimes there appeared unfortunately in the last 70 years we have not been able to to uh, to bridge the gap between the form and reality the content and its achievement the content of the constitution is very rich the form of the constitution is also inclusive but even uh, we we have to to travel a long distance to bridge the gap between what we promised under the constitution and what we have achieved but at the same time i think Two things I would like to say hmm. that uh, right from uh, the, the foundations of hatred or discrimination or the, the kind of uh, the social conflicts at times, the Constitution also provides the instrument for meeting the social conflicts. Uh, the Article 17, for example, untouchability, is, uh, is not only aiming at social uh, kind of a justice, but it also an instrument of removing social conflicts and social inequalities. But at the same time, what we find at times is that politics overtakes the morals of governance. Hmm. And this is here where the question uh, you know, becomes a bit complex. When morality is pushed to the background and politics, and that too very crude kind of a form of politics, when, right. when, when gaining votes becomes the, the priority, then the constitution also sacrificed hmm. for the sake of it. Sure. Right. Yes, uh, Mr. John Dayal, you, want, you, you have a counter. Uh, no, because well, another uh, participant was to speak and I was holding my breath. No, but two or three things, just instant responses. You know. <clears throat> the Constitution has been amended a hundred times and uh, some of them were very radical thing. It's an evolving document, but the basic structure of the Constitution, of course, is sacrosanct. And I think we need to stress that again and again. Equity, freedom of faith, of all sorts of other things, those are things. But some of the issues that the professor raised were very interesting. The gaps are increasing. The gap between the rich and the poor is increasing. And that was something that the Mahatma fought all along. And he says, I am the Gandhi of 20, and I'm the Gandhi of 42. Yes. And in that span, you've seen I'm still the Gandhi of... And still the Gandhi of 42. So you had seen poverty. Uh, that is increasing, I'm afraid, both in proportion and in absolute terms. The fact that he mentioned untouchability. Day before yesterday, in the city of Delhi, three people died trying to clean a sewer, and they all belong to a certain caste because nobody else wants to take up that work. So casteism is alive. And lastly, I would like to say, you know, even when we are recalling Gandhi's uh, defense of the resolution of 1940 to quit India, he said some. He, was, he codified, in, in fact, many things. He said, this is a fight against imperialism, against colonialism, against all sorts of lists, which, is, which today we would call progressive thought. Mm. I mean, he did say that the Congress of that time has outlived. And in his assassination, that Congress ended. In his assassination, that right. Congress ended. And this is now a political wing, very different from there. And it has its own life, and I don't want to go into that at all. So to that extent, his prophecy was again fulfilled. But the resolution itself, his defense of the resolution, are in many ways direct principles of exactly the sort of moral code that Professor Sharma said. And they hold true for us. Whatever day you call today, you call it Good Governor's Day, you call it Improve India Day or whatever. But quit British was also quitting a lot of other things. Sure of the time. Right. Oh, I, both the professors want to uh, get in on the debate and have their say, but I'm going to bring in our other speaker who hasn't had his say as yet. Raji Vora, President Swaraj Peet Trust, joins us on the phone line right now. You know, uh, Raji Vora, you've been listening to the debate uh, for the last 10 minutes or so, listening to what everyone has said thus far. My question to you is, you know, how can we keep the national sentiment of the 1940s alive today in 2017? Uh, first, we have to ask a simple question. What is that sentiment? And if that sentiment was a sentiment of unity among all the sections of Indian, then I think we will have a very negative answer. And that is, I'm not talking about only the impact of the present time, but this is the impact of the past 70 years. I mean, I ask a simple question. I don't have an answer, but I, in questions we can have answers. And this question is, in 1940s, the highest in the land and the lowest in the land 
They were all fighting and striving for one single ideal. They had something common for strive to nationally. Do we have, after Mahatma Gandhi's demise, or I won't say demise, because after that, you know, Mahatma's live a perennial life. But after rejection of Mahatma Gandhi from any national calculus, any policy matters in the rebuilding of India, Mahatma Gandhi was rejected right in 1946-47. I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru had already told him that, I mean, we don't believe in what you are saying. If you chart the path that you are uh, you know, asking us to, what you have written in the Hindu Suraj, and if that is what we are supposed to be following, then the entire nation will get confused. That is an outdated thing. You know, so at that time, the entire nation, the highest and the lowest, were shoulder to shoulder striving for one ideal, which is that ideal we have today, as we can call a national ideal. And we don't have any national ideal. There are ideals of the sectoral sections of the society according to their power and position that they have acquired over past 150 years as the progeny of the British Empire, its imperial rule, and it's the project of transforming India, civilizational India, into the theory of Western civilization. So we are a project. And when we are a project and we have I mean, forgotten our sovereign identity, then I think this is the problem we face. I often ask one simple question. I, you know, conduct, uh, you know, several discourses on mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi's root text, Hindu Suraj, and I ask people ask one simple question. Do you see your self-image in this new modern India somewhere? And I tell you, to my own astonishment, from nowhere, from variety of classes and variety of people among, I have done these discourses, and no one has so far told me that they can see their self-image in what we call this new shining India or new progressive India, you know, that is being built for past 70 years. Right. Okay. So this is the problem. Sure, sure. Okay, both the professors, uh, I've got to give, give, give you a chance to speak. The lady first, go ahead. Okay. Two points. One, I think it's absolutely a wrong interpretation that Gandhiji uh, prophesied the demise of the Congress and that he asked for it. There was, a, this is a wrong reading of it. Um, mistakenly, the Harijan on 2nd February 1948 carried Gandhi's what he had written about the new constitution of the Congress. He would pen some notes. They carried that as with a title called Gandhiji's Last Will and Testament. It was not intended by Gandhiji to be his last will and testament. It was one among a series of engagements that he had on the issue of what is the future of the Congress, a debate and discussion which was being carried out within the Congress organization by Sadiq Ali and Divakar and others and which he had been carrying on talks from Noah Kali onwards. The same issue of the Harijan also carried another writing by Gandhi, where he said the Congress has to live if the nation is to live. It is essential. There is no alternative to the Congress. So this is, a, as I said, a post facto uh, misreading of that. So it has been uh, conveniently from a position of particularly anti-Congress position. This has very much suited people. Recently we had even Amit Shah calling Gandhiji a Chatur Banya for having prophesied the demise of the Congress. The second point was about Gandhiji and Nehru. Now Jawala Nehru was very much Gandhiji's disciple. Yes, there were serious differences, but as you said, when you said, Gandhi said, I am the Gandhi of 1942, Gandhi in 1945-46 was not the Gandhi of Hind Swaraj. Hmm. Gandhiji had moved on. One of the last things that he wrote, which he wrote before his death, he said, I, many people used to come the, and say, why do you not die? Gandhi Murdabad, 
You had sworn never to let the country be partitioned. You had said, over my dead body, now why don't you go on a fast unto death and die? And he said, I have a very big task to complete. This is the industrialization of the villages. This task has to be carried out. Nehru, by 1956, had moved to a position where earlier the dams were temples of modern India after a visit to China, China again, sorry, uh, came back there. He had seen these small dams, which China was very famous for in the rural areas. And he came back very impressed with that. And he came back and implemented that mm. over here. Mm. So there was a change there. Gandhiji in 1945-46, even though many Congress committees had asked for Patel to be the president of the Congress, right. Gandhiji very clearly said, Nehru is my successor. He said very presciently, he said, after I am gone, he will speak my language. Sure. Okay. And another point, just related to this, he said... Yeah, very quickly, about because I'm running yeah, out of time. Yeah, you know, this is a subject Nehru. that we can go on sure. and on and on, but yes. then we've got very limited time. About so. Nehru, he said that he is a person... I mean, of course, after saying that, you know, he is going to speak my language, he said that at the moment we need him because he can understand British colonial rulers. Hmm. He has been part of that culture. So we need a conduit. We need a person right. who can mediate right now between that. So that was his idea. Fine. Fair enough. Yes, Professor Sharma. So, Pereira, I would request you to kindly uh, convene a uh, second debate on, uh, on, on Gandhi and Congress. You must. Uh, because uh, <laughs> I also have the documentary uh, proof and I also have the interpretation. When he said that uh, if, if nation has to live, Congress should live, not as a political party. Congress as an idea, Congress yes. as a movement. So I don't want to go into that debate because that is not the issue today. Yes, that isn't the issue today. Yes, that's right. true. So uh, what, what, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to say is that I would like to agree with what Mr. Vora has said. In fact, the problem lies in the fact that we are emphasizing and highlighting more the disunities rather than the unity. Hmm. We are, uh, we are uh, sacrificing the idea of India to the sectoral and sectional kind of interest. That is the problem. And uh, another thing is that, you know, even if, even if uh, for example, uh, if suppose somebody is killed, which is, of course, uh, 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 unpardonable at any cost, because uh, the, the killing is, is unpardonable. But we look at in, in terms of, oh, a Muslim has been killed, oh, a Dalit has been killed, oh, a non-Muslim has been killed, rather than saying <coughs> a human being has been killed. You see. Uh, the discourse, the, the, the nature of discourse must change. We must look at people not from the point of view of their religion or caste. We must look at the point, uh, at, the, at the, uh, the heart from the viewpoint of a human being. We have lost a life. Right. And that is a precious life. Sure. Whether it is of a non-Hindu or a Hindu or a Muslim or a Sikh, every life is important. So therefore, uh, we must change that kind of a, a discourse. That is my right. submission. And, and, the second, and the second is that Gandhi's vision, in fact, uh, has been implemented in many ways. For example, if you talk of the uh, empowerment of the localities, empowerment of the, of the villages, to a large extent, at least I can speak after 73rd and 74th Amendment on the Constitution, that uh, the powers are being sought to be devolved and, and democracy is being sought to be deepened. And the, and, the, and the inclusiveness is also visible at that level. We have made a, a large representation to women and scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So as uh, um, uh, Mr. John Jal said that ours is an evolving system and many things are being corrected from time to time where there are some kind of uh, you know, the differences. Sure. The Mr. only thing is that the uh, values mm. of liberty and what we call freedom should not override the values of sovereignty and integrity and unity of the society as well as of the nation. Nation, true. Very, mm -hmm. very well pointed out. Yeah. yeah. 30 I've, seconds. I've, I've got, no, I've got two minutes left, so I'm oh, going to good. wind up with closing comments from okay. everyone. Yeah. So, uh, beginning with you, Mr. Dayal, your closing comments. Yeah, no, I, I thought for Gandhi, symbolism was very important. The fact that the barrister ultimately ended up with just a loincloth is symbolic. The fact that although he did understand as 
all seers have understood that all mankind is the same and one's death it's a human being dying yet he goes to Noah Kali right he goes to Noah Kali and makes a point he sets up his house in what was then the Bhangi colony mm -hmm. and makes a point again right and these two points point out that he identifies and fights the myths fights the partitions fights the divisions sure I think that to me this mm. frail old man with the lati is a fighter this right. is how I would like to remember it okay fair enough uh, Mr. Bora your closing comments on the program very quickly uh, look I would say that uh, yes this 1942 Gandhi and 1947 or 1948 38th January Gandhi are the same Gandhi okay sure and I think what we need to do as his progeny is to learn from him and I think still we have not yet sincerely started learning I give you just one example mm. ask any professor to define the very term Swaraj which Gandhi gave and which awakened India even if you take up the dictionary Oxford University dictionary the latest edition you right. will find the meaning of Swaraj, the term Gandhi invoked, uh, just opposite of what Gandhi meant. So this is our intellectual state today. We have not so, understood the fundamentals of Gandhi, his very fight against tradition and modernity. Within mm -hmm. that mode he fought and he took India on a different path. Path, its right. own path, its own self rediscovery. I think okay. we have to continue rediscovering ourselves by implicating ourselves into it and not by objectifying India for a self discovery. Fair enough. Professor Marjan, very quickly your closing comment. Yeah, I think that what Gandhi said in 1942, I just try emphasize the relevance of that. He gave a call for Quit India at that time from imperialism. Mm. And today, we could very well give that same call of Quit India from intolerance, from okay. discrimination, you know, from injustice, Com from out, hatred. Completely out of time. Professor Sharma, close the show for us with your concluding you know, remarks. I, I would just uh, agree with, uh, with what has been said that let the problems of poverty, unemployment, uh, communalism, discrimination, they should quit India. And Gandhi, in fact, would be very happy if these uh, problems are, are tackled with a sense of commitment right rather than rhetoric okay fair enough on that note then we'll have to call it a wrap on this edition of the big picture Sucheta Mahajan, Rajiv Vora, Rajveer Sharma, John Dayal thank you so much for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us that's all the time we have today see you again next time